Welcome back to part eight and the final part of our Stellaris tutorial series. We are talking about warfare and how to win the game. Now, this is probably going to be our last main episode in the tutorial series, but I would like to do one more if we get enough comments down below. Uh, I would love to hear what other questions you have about Stellaris and about the game. And let me know what more you would like me to talk about. I'll do an FAQ as our last episode if I get enough of these, and I'll cover a whole bunch of little odds and ends in the game that maybe I didn't explain the tutorial, or maybe you just like a little bit more info about. So drop the questions in the comments. Let's jump right into Warfare. Now, at the beginning of our last episode, we had met the Spear Kata, who are bordering our empire. And actually, funny enough, we are boarded on both sides. We've got the ancient mining drones to the east, and we have the Spear Kata to the north. And we know that this is a hostile empire that does not like us. They do not. They are not going to be our friends, and we are probably going to come to war with them. So there are a couple things that we should do to prepare for that. The first I've already started in the last part of the series is I started building defensive platforms, which we use on star bases as a static, non-mobile way to defend our territory. You can build defensive platforms by going to your star base by clicking on this icon, going over to the defensive section and choosing the defensive platform. You can build a bunch of these up to a cap, which you'll see here, your star or your defensive platforms cap one out of six, because we've got one here already. We're building five more. Because we only have one way into our system, I would recommend that we use defensive platforms instead of ships to defend. If you are running an empire that has a, a bunch of sprawling hyper lanes that are going all over the place and different ways of getting into your opponent's space, I would recommend you build ships instead. But bang for your buck, defensive platforms are the best way to defend your systems from your opponents. Now, I'm actually gonna undo this. And I'm gonna, uh, you know, actually, no, I, I will go with our, our defensive platform, that's fine. I'm gonna take one of these off. And I'll explain in a little bit why I'm doing that, because not only are you going to wanna build ships, but you're going to want to customize your ships as well. And that includes defensive platforms. So we've been building these Corvettes, right? That have been moving between Seoul and Naranka because we wanted to uh, make sure that the trade that was being collected here was actually uh, was actually being collected in one of our old tutorials. We, te we tore down that Starbase. So I'm gonna take these, these Corvettes and I'm gonna bring them up to the front line. Definitely, 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 you should be housing your ships at your front line before war. It's very important. Similarly, on this uh, on this starbase, I've got these modules that we could build up, and there are a couple of different defensive buildings that you might consider building. The crew quarters is going to reduce your upkeep costs of the ships that are docked there. And you know, if we were in a bit of an energy crisis, I might consider the crew quarters, but we're not, so I'm not going to worry about them. Instead, I'm looking at these last three: the target uplink computer the communications jammer, and the disruption field generator. All of these are really powerful defensive options for your starbase. And frankly, if you upgrade your starbase high enough, you can get all of these as, as buildings on the starbase. But right now we can only choose one. We've got a couple of different options that are interesting. We've got ship weapons range increase, which is actually particularly good. All of our defensive platforms will be able to shoot 50% farther. So as our enemy's ships are flying in, we'll be able to shoot them down as they're coming at us. Not all of them, but you know, we'll be able to have a little bit more damage against them than we would otherwise. The communications jammer will, will create this debuff on our opponent's ships, which reduce their sublight speed, that is the speed that they move inside of a system by 20%. And it reduces what's called combat disengagement chance, which is when two fleets come head to head and fight each other, what percentage of your ships will actually be saved and can come back in a new battle, right? Their combat disengagement chance will be reduced by 20%, which means out of their normal disengaged ships, 20% of that will be destroyed forever, which is kind of what we want. That's a great one. 
And another good one actually is the Disruption Field Generator, which will reduce their shield hit points by 20%. So if I'm looking at these three right now, Disruption Field Generator feels like it's it's a really good one. I, I think that's that's a good one to build. Any of these are particularly good, and especially because we don't know what our opponent's ships look like or how many of them there are. We don't really have a lot to go off of, but I bet you they got some shields. So we're going to build the Disruption Field Generator at the end of this list here. Cool. And let's let that run. Now, we also built a Sterion into a into a shipyard, right? We built our two shipyards here. And what that allows us to do is it allows us to build new ships just like we were doing at our capital. I'm going to use this as our forward military ship base. But while I could build the Corvettes in this list, there is a better way to do it. And I haven't shown you this because it hasn't really been relevant, but it's becoming relevant now. So let's take a look at that. If Instead of clicking on this icon, going to shipyard and slamming a bunch of Corvettes down, I'll cancel these. Instead, we go to the Fleet Manager. And in the Fleet Manager, we can manage all of our existing military fleets. This doesn't include your science vessels, it doesn't include your, your construction ships, but it includes the Corvettes that we have in our little group there that are flying across space trying to get to the front lines. Here they are. Uh, I don't know where they are right now. Where are they? Oh, right here. These little guys right here, right? The Fleet Manager allows us to quickly manage that fleet. Right now, we have a fleet of eight Corvettes because we just built them and, and, and put them out there. And we can increase this to a total of our fleet command limit. This is something that can be increased in the technology tree as you play the game. But right now, our fleet command limit is very low. It's at 20 only. And if we increase this number of Corvettes on this fleet, we can increase it to 20 out of 20. So we'll have 20 Corvettes. Each one has a fleet command power of one. And each one of those takes up one of our fleet command limit. What that means is I could have a fleet of 20 Corvettes, but if I had to build a sec, if I wanted a 21st Corvette, that Corvette will stand alone in its own fleet. Sometimes there's a reason to do that. Most of the time, it's better for you to really build up your fleets and have really focused fleets that are good at a particular thing, that are good at the thing that they need to do. You can build well-balanced fleets that you use in your everyday usage, but as you get further in the game, you will unlock better and better ships. Battleships move a lot slower than Corvettes do. And if they're in a fleet together, your fleet will move at the speed of your slowest ship. So you'll have all these Corvettes moving at the speed of a battleship. Sometimes that's a good thing. Sometimes you actually want a dedicated Corvette fleet, not only for stuff like, uh, you know, uh, patrolling your trade routes, but also for doing surprise attacks, really quick in and out attacks against your opponents using your Corvette fleets. Just keep that in mind. If we wanted to, we could build a new fleet and we could choose what designs for that fleet we have on the right side. You'll notice that we only have a single Corvette design and that's because we haven't customized any of our ships. We're gonna do that right now. So let's go into the ship designer and I'm going to take a look at the existing Corvette design. This is the design that all of our Corvettes have right now. And it includes a, uh, a single, because Corvettes are so small, a single section, which determines what that ship does and what its capabilities can be. You can customize all of this. You can choose to put on only lasers so that your ships only fire lasers or put on only mass drivers so that your ships only uh, fire projectiles. But why would you want to do one versus the other? The game doesn't really explain this very well. I'll explain it to you. So instead of customizing this Corvette, I'm gonna create a new design, a new Corvette. And in here, I'm going to choose a section. Now, we've got the option for a missile boat, an interceptor, or a picket ship. A missile boat is a, uh, a ship that fires both a turret weapon and a missile, which is kind of notated by G. I'm not sure why, why G exactly. Uh, but it gives you two options for nuclear missiles and a single turret, right? Um, nuclear missiles are usually a little bit more powerful than projectiles and lasers are, but 
missiles can be shot down with point defense. And so if you have a sense that your opponent doesn't have any point defense, using missiles is usually a good idea. Similarly, uh, each one of these weapons that you can attach on a ship has a different strength and weakness. So if we just hover over the small red laser, let's take a look at this. You'll notice that it uses an amount of power, it's five power, and it has a cost, which means for every small red laser on our Corvette, it will cost us an additional 10 alloys to build that Corvette. So you can have Corvettes that are very cheap to produce, or you can have Corvettes that are actually a little bit more expensive to produce based on the type of weaponry and the type of utility components that they have equipped on them, okay? So this small red laser, it does six to 16 damage. It fires every 4.6 days, I think that is, like cycles. It is 90% accurate, which means it's really good at, at tracking targets and, and shooting, or sorry, at hitting targets once it's tracked them and hitting them. And it's got 50% tracking. And this is a very, very, very important number for you to consider when building your ships. Tracking is probably maybe the most important number, second to the type of damage that it does, okay? So I'll get back to tracking in a sec. Uh, the range is how, far it can engage, bigger weapons can engage further, smaller weapons can engage at a shorter distance. On Corvettes, of course, we're flying around in, in really tight circles around our opponents, so they've got a pretty short range. And then skipping average damage, we'll skip down to the section that shows you what type of damage this laser does. It does 50% reduced damage to shields, and it does 50% increased damage to armor. This is a really, really, really good weapon to take down your opponent's armor. And it's not as good at taking down your opponent's shields, okay? This will come into importance in a sec when we drop down to the utility section, right? Most ships, the utility section is always the same, what, regardless of which sections you choose for your ships. If I cho chose to turn this from a missile boat into an interceptor, we have the exact same options down here. Uh, but for now, we are going to just throw this back on here, throw this back on here, and let's take a look at utilities which are equally important. This is your armor and your shields. How you choose to trade off between armor and shields will determine how strong your ships are against your opponents based on their weaponry. This is kind of this game of like cat and mouse, right? If your opponents are using ships that have a lot of red lasers, remember lasers are weak against shields you might want to go into the utility component and put on deflectors, okay? You'll even get some components here. I don't think the reactor booster is, is what I'm thinking of now, uh, but you might even get some components here that improve your, your shield value, right? If you put a ship with all shields but no armor, keep in mind that if they've got a bunch of lasers and they break through your shields, now they're going straight to your hull. Your ships have three types of HP. They've got hull points, armor points, and shield points. And the amount of each one of these is determined by which of these utilities you place on the ship. You'll notice that our shields just decreased by 50 and our armor just increased by 50. And this percentage trade-off of hull, armor, and shields determines how susceptible your ships are in combat. For the most part, I would recommend that you have a pretty balanced, like when you have three of these options, you're either gonna have two shields and one armor, or you're gonna have two armor and one shields. But the really important thing to note about the difference between these two is that shields consume power. And your ships only have a certain amount of power to provide to their systems. Everything from your lasers to shields to sometimes I think even, yeah, even some of these kind of modifiers on the right side use an amount of power. Ideally, for the best possible ship, you don't have to do this all the time, for the best possible ship, your power will equal zero at the end of creation. What that means is you have an equal amount of power generation and, and, and uh, combat capability, okay? If I were to take this armor off and place a deflector, you'll notice that the power now is in the negatives, which means I can't build this ship. I can't power it. If it can't be powered, it can't be built. So keep in mind that balancing that is a really important balancing act 
or your ship design. Now, there is a way that we can bypass this, which is we have researched the reactor booster technology. And this reactor booster, if we hover over these little hexagons here, it tells us what they do. The reactor booster will generate 20 power for, for us. So I can place that on the, um, the augment kind of section here. And now our ship power is plus five. That's pretty good, that's good. You know, we've got a little bit of extra power generation, not the end of the world, really. And it allows us to build three shields. I don't need that. And it's more expensive if I do it that way. So instead, I'm just gonna throw on two shields and one armor and we're good to go, cool. Our ship looks good. Our evasion number is pretty important. Smaller ships have higher evasion, bigger ships have lower evasion. Kind of makes sense, right? And this evasion number is what allows them to bypass um, things like accuracy. So accuracy and evasion are these two numbers that determine whether a hit will actually hit a ship or not. Corvettes are, are notoriously very fast. They've got high evasion and high speed, which allows them to zip around and avoid a lot of big hits from big guns. So I want to create this in our ship designer. I'll, what a lot of people run into, and this is an issue that is kind of frustrating even to me after 400 hours, 500, 600 hours of the game, was you try to press the save and it says auto design takes control over upgrading. And usually you've got this this like menu over it and you're like, well, what the heck? I can't save my ship. It's because you've got to click on the X in the upper left hand corner and then you have to click on auto generate designs. And once you've unchecked that, now you can create a design that uh, suits you and suits your, you know, your goals in the game. Uh, let's, let's do it. Let's create the gazelle class Corvettes. I'm going to choose save. And in fact, not only choose to save, really important one to choose is the auto upgrade checkmark box here, because as you're gaining new technology, your weapons and your shield and your armors are going to improve in value, but you won't actually have these upgraded on your ships unless you either go back into the ship designer and swap them out or the auto upgrade button is checked. So I always check this, it's usually a good thing to do until you get really good at the game and you understand which ones you wanna auto upgrade and which ones you don't. And choose save. Cool. And now our gazelle class ship is created and we can actually go back to Asterion and we can now choose between the jackal class, which is the first type of ship that we built or the uh, gazelle class, which we just built now. So I want a couple of gazelle class ships. I'm gonna slam some of those out. And because we have those two shipyards in the star base, we are actually able to build two ships at a time. That's the value of building a shipyard, uh, multiple shipyards on a star base. Cool. So similarly, if we go back to the fleet manager, our fleet of jackal class ships uh, we could add some more Jackal class ships if we'd like to, or if I click this add ship design to fleet, I could instead use the Gazelle class ships in this list. Now I'm clicking on this, it's not working because our design allows us to create 20 Jackal class ships. If I lower this and now add to fleet, I can add the Gazelle class and say that we want 10 of each, you know. I wouldn't recommend you necessarily do this. I think it's a little bit bloated and, and gets a little bit confusing. You could always go back into the ship designer and delete an old design if you'd like to, because you're not using it anymore or because you don't need the auto generation that the that the AI built for you, right? Uh, so we could delete this Jackal class ship if we want to. I'm not going to do for now because the one thing I wanna show you is something that's actually really, really, really helpful. We've built these gazelle class ships which are great. I think they're better than the Jackal class. In fact, I would love it if all of our Jackal class ships were changed into Gazelle class ships because I think that it's the superior design. From the fleet manager, there's a couple different things that we can do. The first is we can choose the retrofit tool. And I am going to say that all of our Jackal class ships should be retrofitted into Gazelle class ships. Sounds great. They are going to go back into our shipyards. They're gonna rip off all of the different sections of our ship, like the, the, the extra turrets, and they're gonna install the, uh, the missile launchers for us on those ships. But before we do that, before that happens, we have to upgrade the fleet. And upgrading your fleet will take it and it will send it back to a shipyard to be upgraded. 
So here's our fleet here of Jackal class ships. If I choose the upgrade action, you'll notice that they've changed from going to Feynov to going to Asterion because this is the closest place with multiple shipyards where our ships are going to be able to upgrade themselves, which is great. So let's let them do that. Let's dismiss some of these pop-ups. Let's grab maybe an aggressive technology like Ceramo Metal Armor actually would be good. And if I'm not mistaken, if we go back to Ship Designer, yeah, that's what I thought. We actually just unlocked a new technology, which is Coil Guns 2. And Coil Guns 2 is an improvement of our small mass drivers. You'll notice that our small mass drivers used to do five to 16 damage. Our coil guns actually do seven to 21 damage, which is, you know, a small increase, but every increase in this counts. And you might have 20 Corvettes, so you're multiplying that increase by the number of ships that you have. If I take this coil gun and I place it on this uh, on the small mass driver, you'll notice that our power generation has now become negative. And that's because we're not producing enough power to support the improved value of our coil gun. Our power generation primarily is determined by your reactor on your ships, which is a technology that you can, that you can research. I haven't researched that technology, but again, we can take a reactor booster and balance that right out. And now we have an improved coil gun that we researched in the technology tree on a ship with enough power generation to support a lot more upgrades. We could support two more upgrades for small red lasers if we were still using the, uh, the Jackal class ships, but we're not, right? So moving on, our ships are going to head back to Asterion. They're going to dock at the star base because it's got a bunch of uh, a bunch of shipyards, and then those ships are going to be retrofitted with missile launchers and turned into gazelle class ships. Here they come. And they're just gonna chill out there for a second. I think this only takes a, a little bit to happen. These little icons kind of come off the top of your ships when they're upgrading. And uh, boom, our fleet has been upgraded successfully. Now what we have is a fleet of eight gazelle class ships and a fleet of five gazelle class ships. Pretty sweet. In the fleet manager, if we come back to here, we can see that our two fleets are separate from one another. And I could go into our second fleet and build a whole bunch more Corvettes on this fleet if I'd like to, but I've got them. They're, they're already built. You know, we've got a total of 13. They're just in two separate fleets. So instead of doing that, now actually in addition to doing that, I'm gonna merge these two fleets together. So I'm gonna take my fleet of five, I'm gonna hold shift, Take my fleet of eight, and you'll notice that on the left side with these selected, we've got a whole bunch of buttons, all these blue buttons suppressed, but the one that you're really interested in is the merge button, which is going to merge your two fleets into a single fleet together of size 13, and all of your 13 Corvettes hanging out there together. Why you might wanna merge instead of keeping your fleets separate is because just like science, and just like uh, your armies, and just like your governors, you can recruit an admiral to this fleet, and your admiral will bring very powerful bonuses to your uh, to your potential, right? Our new leader, our new admiral, will have a trait that allows us to have a really powerful benefit, sometimes even some powerful um, uh, debuffs to our ships in exchange for something else. So we've got two traits that we can take a look at right now just because of the leaders and what they, what they have right now. Uh, Magdalena, gives all of our ships increased evasion and sublight speed. And that's actually really good for Corvettes because Corvettes have high evasion and they've got high sublight speed. That just means that this Admiral is really good at piloting a fleet of Corvettes. Uh, otherwise, we've got a uh, Admiral Horatio or, ooh, that is a name, Masuku, um, that give our ships increased hull points and weapon damage. but. Corvettes aren't really that powerful. They don't have big guns. They don't have a lot of hull points. So I think in this choice, if we're thinking about the early game, Gale Speed is usually a really good choice for Corvettes. I'm gonna choose a Gale Speed uh, Admiral. And I don't know if you caught that, but the fleet power, the military power of this fleet increased just a little bit. It increased from 502, which it was previously, to 538 because of the power of our commander, uh, our Admiral. So that's pretty cool. Now, this is only 13 out of 20 ships. The way that you can 
build more, of course, as we can go back to our star base and go to our shipyard and build more Corvettes, but those Corvettes will sit in this system. And that's like, that's not where you need them. You need them at the front lines. So instead, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna take our ships, bring them to Fainoff, and I'm just gonna let them uh, get there so I can, I can show you what this looks like and get rid of some of this while that's happening and take this just because I wanna get off the screen. Our Corvettes have made it there. And now I want to build up a fleet of 20 Corvettes. Again, we could build them here, but our Corvettes will sit here and we'll have to manually move them and manually merge them, which is just a big pain in the butt. Instead, if you use the fleet manager from anywhere in the galaxy, I can click on my fleet and I can choose reinforce. And what this does is it queues up these ships to be created at the nearest star base. And those ships will automatically move through space secretly, not on the screen, but actually they are, they are flying from system to system to catch up to our Corvettes. We actually have a pop-up that shows that reinforcements in transit. And in a couple of months, those Corvettes that we've just created at that Starbase will fly and join our Corvettes here in Feynoff. That'll happen in like just a second here. I think it's on the 10th. They've arrived in the system. I think that was the sound of them arriving. Yep. And now they will automatically merge in with your fleet of Corvettes. You don't have to merge them manually. You don't have to worry about it. You can reinforce your fleets from the fleet manager or you can reinforce them from the fleet panel by clicking this button, this little icon with the two arrows. Really valuable, really worth using. Cool. So we've got a small fleet of Corvettes. They're stationed at a station with a number of defense platforms. And you, you remember that I chose to build five instead of six defense platforms. That was because in the ship designer, you can also customize your defense platforms as well. You can build defense platforms that have coil gun twos on them instead. And we can save this. We can even overwrite that, uh, that design if we'd like to. And in this view, we can now build the new design that I've just built, or we can upgrade our existing, uh, our existing defense platforms with the new style. Remember to do this frequently because the game will not do this automatically for you. Look at that. I, I swear I could not have planned this better. I could not have planned this better. Uh, we have just been declared war on by the Spear Kata and they want to conquer Feynoff. Now, what they're trying to do is they're trying to go to war with us for a single system, because it's actually a very valuable system between our two empires, right? It's it's really valuable. And it would be great if, if we too could win something from this war. Right now, we can't, but we've got a couple of options in our arsenal to do so, and I'll show you what those look like. First of all, when war is declared on you, you have to set a war goal. And your options in these goals are uh, are the things that you have the ability to do. You can just, for by default, in a defensive war, you can humiliate the attackers. You can destroy them. If they declare war on you and you win, imagine how humiliating that would be for them. That is the de facto war goal that you can have on any empire at any time. But wouldn't it be great if we could get something from this war? Like, wouldn't it be nice if we could actually win some territory and and grab a little bit of space from the Spirit Kata? And that would be more interesting to me than humili humiliating them personally, right? You can do that. I'm gonna click out of this X carefully. I don't wanna click out of this one. You can do that and probably should before war is declared on you in the claims panel. Now, let's talk a little bit about systems and claims. Remember how your construction vessels go across the galaxy and they, they grab star bases by building star bases on them? So those star bases cost alloys and they also cost influence, okay? Claims are a way for you to say, you own that? I own that. Like, that's mine. That is my, that is my territory. That is supposed to be mine. I deserve that system. And if we face off in a war and I take it, I'm gonna keep it. Claims are incredibly important. They're incredibly powerful. So we've got a system here, Yakri. It's actually the only system that I can see in the space owned by this empire, uh, Yakri, that we can claim. And by claiming it, we will be able to win that system in a war where our war goal is to conquer our enemy. 
okay? So I want Yakuri, I'm gonna add it to the list. I could claim Spear Kata, but you'll notice that the claim cost for Spear Kata compared to Yakuri, Yakuri was like, was it 40? 40 influence? Spa the claim cost for Spear Kata is 220 influence. And why that is, is because it becomes more and more expensive for you to claim systems that are further from your borders. You can do it, but it's much more expensive. So if we wanted to claim the home world of the Spear Kata, we could do this right now. But two things, it's very expensive to do it. And the only way we could actually win that is by claiming the system and keeping it. And I'm not sure if I could pull that off right now. That's pretty far and I don't even know how to get there. So I'm not gonna claim this one, but I will take Yakuri because we believe it's ours. We deserve Yakuri. Yakuri should be our system. And I will make my claims. Now that my claims are made, if we go back to the set war goal, you'll notice that because we have claims, instead of saying, I just want to humiliate the, the Spear Kata, they're kind of jerks. You know, they declared war on us. Let's get rid of them. Uh, instead, we can say, you know what? You've declared on war on us. I declare war on you. You're going down. And we could choose the conquer option for our war goal. You can only get systems that you have claims of if you choose the conquer war goal. So keep that in mind, whether you are declaring war yourself or whether war is being declared on you. So I'm gonna set that as our war goal. And this brings up a panel here. It's also accessible in the bottom right-hand corner. I'll try to move my, my video when this happens. The bottom right-hand corner, which shows us the progress of the war. This will include all details. How many space battles did we have? Who won those space battles? How much attrition was done to our own people, to our own systems, to our own planets? And who's winning, right? At a certain point, this war will end. And it will end in one of four ways. Technically three, kind of four. Either one side will surrender and the other side just de facto wins. Or both sides decide, you know what? We're gonna stop this war. Whatever you own right now is what you keep if you have claims for it. And whatever you don't own, you lose, okay? This is usually the way that most battles, most wars uh, end if the two sides are, are kind of duking it out for a long period of time. Or, and this is very, very, very rare, one side has achieved all of its war goals. It has completely decimated the other side. It has gathered all of its claims. It has humiliated and destroyed the opponent's fleets and it's time to time to end it. We can move on. This is very rare to, to happen, but it does happen in the game. What is most likely to happen is that these percentages represent exhaustion. What's most likely to happen is your empire or the opponents get so tired of fighting that they can fight no more. And at that point, the opposing side is able to say, we're ending this war, this is it, it's over. And whether you like it or not, the war will be finished at that point. If your opponent's exhaustion is, is brought to 100%, you can determine the terms of what that ending looks like. If your exhaustion is brought to 100%, they will determine the timing and the terms of what that looks like. Exhaustion is created from damage to your planets. It's created from losing ships and battles. It's created from losing systems. There's a lot of different ways that your empire is just gonna get sick of this. Like, why are we still fighting? This is ridiculous. And so keep that in mind as you're playing that your exhaustion and keeping an eye on it in the bottom right-hand corner, your exhaustion is really important to manage throughout the course of a war. Okay, so we're in our first war. Let's let's do it, let's war. Uh, we have this system of Yakuri, which we have peeked into before. And so we see that it has a small star base of 150 power, easy enough for our fleet of 700 fleet power to take on. So I'm gonna move them into Yakuri now and, um, and take that system. The other thing worth noting is that there's a whole bunch of systems out here that we have no idea what the heck's going on in these systems. There's a couple of tools we can use to find information out about that. The first is, remember, we have our spy master who is sitting in the in the Spear Kata and they're learning about them. We can actually gather some information about that empire. I'm not gonna go into this panel because there's a lot here. It's a whole explanation all to itself, but I will say I want them to gather information on the Spear Kata, so let's do that. 
The other way is just how we do with our science vessels. I'm actually going to need sort of a, let's call them like a military scientist. I'm going to need a military scientist to come join us and, and find out about these systems. So I'm going to bring them with us here and bring them into Yakuri. Now, I can't actually give the order for them to go into the system. And it's because scientists by default try to avoid conflict. Makes sense, right? They don't have ship uh, uh, weapons on board their ships. So they're gonna try to avoid conflict systems. You can disable this by choosing your fleet stance and setting it to passive on that science vessel. And now they'll move into Yakuri, no problem. And, and they'll be able to explore it. So let's go ahead and do that. You'll notice that our ships now, I'm gonna set this to slowest, like I said, uh, in one of our tutorial videos with Solaris. Uh, our ships are now attacking the star base owned by our neighbor, and they've almost got it down. This is the health, and above it, I didn't get here fast enough, would be the armor and the shields. But our ships are circling around the star base, attempting to blow it up and seize it for ourselves, which we'll do in just a second here. Boom, there it goes. We had a successful fleet uh, uh, engagement inside of Yakuri, and now something has changed here. Yakuri has this icon with these little spikes coming off of it. And if I scroll over this, it shows me that the system is fully occupied by the United Nations of Earth, which is our own empire. What that means is we occupy the system, but we don't own it. We will own this system at the end of the war if we settle status quo or if our opponent surrenders. But until that happens, all we do is occupy it. The star base in the center belongs to us. It, it will shoot down uh, and, and shoot at our opponent's ships. But other than that, we can't do much with it. And, and we can't just decide to, to, you know, to control it in many of the ways that you control the systems that you actually do own yourself. I'm gonna build another defense platform here. So keep that in mind. Uh, I'm gonna take now, because we got our first victory, our vessels and we're going to send them to uh, let's send them inwards towards our opponents and while this is happening too i would love to reinforce our fleet i can't right now because i don't have the alloys to do it but i'll go into the market i'll buy a bunch of alloys because we're at war right and i'll reinforce our fleet to to round out our fleet 19 out of 20. i could build a second fleet now with the alloys that i have in fact I would recommend that you do. I think that's a very strong move, even though it's going to break something in the game, which I'll explain in just a second. But let's go ahead and do that. Let's go to the fleet manager, create new. Let's add our gazelle class ships here, add 20 to them and build a new fleet of gazelle class ships in Asterion to back up our, our second fleet here that's moving in. We'll also want an admiral for that fleet. We'll also want to make sure that that fleet is uh, is like looking good and catches up to the battles here. Now, our uh, our military vessels are moving through Yakuri. They are about to, I'm on the slowest speed. That's why this is taking, so I was like, what's going on? Um, they're about to move into the next system, adjacent system here. And here we have another battle to do where we are going to engage against this star base. You'll notice that every single time you take a star base, the view of the next system becomes available, just like that happened. That's because this starbase is sort of blocking our view. We've never been in these systems before. We've never seen their hyperlanes. So this is a really, 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 really risky thing to do when you're moving your ships around, right? Would you move your ships into a system where there are three paths for your opponent's ships to possibly come through and destroy you? I, I don't think I would in real life. I think that's really scary. So instead, I'm gonna dock our ships here. We're just gonna wait for our military science vessel to come in because I would rather risk a science vessel than I would risk my majority of my fleet, right? I think that makes the most sense. I think that makes a lot of sense. Okay, our fleet, unfortunately third fleet, I think was built in the fleet manager at the wrong, uh, <laughs> at the wrong system. They were built in um in uh, like further away from the front lines which is not what i wanted i should have chosen their home base as the Feynov system and assigned them there so that they could actually be uh be brought there but you know here we are so i'm gonna actually take this fleet and bring it up to Feynov and have it move in that direction so that they can reinforce our our main fleet up front in front of uh, uh of the battle 
This fleet that is up here is, I'm a little bit scared to bring them forward. So let's get our science vessel to go and explore that system. They're going to do that first, but here is what I was waiting for. I was waiting for our opponent's fleets to come into view because I have no idea how powerful they are. They now have shown their cards and they've got a fleet power of about 1000. We've got a fleet power of about 800. Those are not good odds for us. We are going to lose this battle. We've got a little bit of sight into what our enemies are doing, right? They're actually taking their Corvettes and it looks like they're beelining it for Ethuk, Ethuk. And that means that we are going to probably lose this battle if we go head to head against their ships. So I'm actually gonna take this opportunity to back up to Feynoff, wait for reinforcements to arrive, and then we are going to engage them when the odds are on our side. Cool. Now, these ships are uh, are heading across this portion of the galaxy. They are going to go into Ethuk and take back this system. Because remember, we took the Starbase. It, it, shoot, it fights for us right now. I don't think it's strong enough to counter the, the larger fleet of our opponents, but it is something that... Um, that it will do a little bit of damage to our opponents for us as it's as it's on our side for the time being. So in just a second here, we're going to see them pop in. Here they are. And just like we did, they are going to fire at the star base and take it back. And this is going to wrest control of this system back to the Spear Kata. Okay? Too bad. That's fine. A, a small, small loss, a, a tiny, small battle lost. No big deal. We are going to be, I think, the vict victors of this combat at the end of it. Their fleet of 1000 has now um, has now solidified itself. It's now a, a thousand fleet power in a single fleet, which is a little bit scary because we could only actually muster 868 fleet power in a single fleet, probably because of the weaponry that we have on board our ships. But if we can win in numbers, we can definitely win win the battle. So that's that's what we're going to have to do. I'm going to build a couple more Corvettes by reinforcing our second fleet. And let's also make sure that we put a leader on it. We have two different new traits here. We've got a trickster trait and the resilient trait. Trickster is the way to go. I don't really like either of these particularly, but it's better for combat. And so I'm going to run that one. And our fleet power of 394 is coming in. We are, should be able to take on their 1000 with our com combined power of about 1,400 here. So let's do it. Uh, 1,200, technically. 1,200. Uh, so let's do it. We are going to take our fleets with admirals, and we are going to move them into Yakuri. They have a very small um, star base that they now take, you know, have control of, and we have a little bit of a larger fleet. It just repaired itself. A little bit of a larger fleet in terms of numbers that may win this battle. I hope it does, but it really depends on a lot of things. It depends on what the weaponry of their ships are. It depends on whether they're using shields versus uh, using, um, using armor. It depends on if our weapons are really tuned against their, their defenses and if their weapons are tuned against our defenses. But we'll speed this up, this just beautiful flashing of, of lasers and um, and spirals. And in a second, we will see who the victor of this is. Now, we can keep an eye on this and see a couple of things that are changing, right? Our fleet power is decreasing. This used to be like 896, it's now 785. It's because our ships are being destroyed. Their fleet power used to be 1,000. It's 500 now, baby. It's looking good. So we are going to let this play out because I think unless they bring in more ships, we've got this one in the bag. And not only that, but some really good things are happening. Yeah, looks like we won this one easy. Beautiful, 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 beautiful. Okay, our fleet has taken a lot of damage, but we won the battle. We did a bunch of damage to them, a bunch of damage. We destroyed their entire, what I think is probably their entire main fleet. And what that means is it's probably time for us to press our advantage. We are going to just ram through these systems and take as many as we possibly can. Why we're doing that is because I want to push our opponent's uh, exhaustion to the point that we can say, it's time to end this war, it's time to finish it. 
While I'm doing this though, we can also make some claims in the middle of this combat. Keep in mind, claims made during wartime are more expensive than claims made during peace. So this is kind of an expensive venture for us, but I think we deserve the systems. So we're going to make a whole bunch of claims on the adjacent systems that our opponents own technically right now for the time being. They're going to be ours in a little bit. So we are going to go ahead and ram through and take as many of these as we can. We'll take a Thuk. And we'll take Aftushan. Aftushan, sounds good. Let's grab that one because we've got a claim on it. And hopefully we don't see like a massive fleet here or here on these adjacent systems when we take this one. Now we're good. And then let's head back to Chariot and grab Chariot. Or you know what, actually, let's not and I'll show you the importance of owning systems when you perform a white piece. So you'll notice, you may have noticed that if I go into this view here, we have the option to settle status quo. This is because we've achieved our war goals. Our opponent is at 40% war exhaustion. And most importantly, our relative strength of our Navy is so much higher than theirs because we wiped them out. That's a really, really, really powerful thing, which means that we've got the option to do what's called a white piece or settling status quo. This is, hey, we're done. We're done fighting. We have what we own. You have what you own. Let's just end it there. And you can actually see what the results of this decision will be um, when you when you take a look at uh, oh you used to be able to actually it doesn't it doesn't seem like you can you can do it here anymore but what this oh here it is if you scroll over this what this is saying is the defenders will take control of the systems Athuk, Yakuri, and F Jishan. Sounds great to me. The attackers get nothing at all. They will lose those systems. And you'll notice that we don't win Shariat. And that's because we haven't conquered it. We don't own it. We don't control it. And if you don't control a system that you have a claim on when you choose to settle status quo, you will not gain it. So I would not recommend doing this. If I were playing the game for real, I would take my, my ships here, bring them down to Shariat and take it. But for the sake of this tutorial, just to see, just to show you what would happen, let's pretend I forgot that Shariat even existed and I have a claim and I didn't take it. Or our opponents have taken it back and we have to settle status quo. It has to happen right now. We would go here, settle status quo, and send the offer, which the opponent can either accept or deny. In a multiplayer game, the player actually has a choice. In a single player game or up against AI, the check mark means that they will accept it. The X means they will not accept it. So, the spear kata, ah, their, their, their phrasing has changed here a little bit. The, the circumstances dictate that we put an end to this war. We must accept this for now. And look at that. The empire of the United Nations of Earth has expanded to the three systems that we just claimed and took and won from our opponents. We can now do a couple different things here. Because we own this system, I can actually build up this star base into a starport. And it is now the forward operating force of our, of our empire. And this could be our defensive position where our ships sit and wait for our next battle against the Spear Kata. Uh, keep in mind, doing this this way with the Shariat was a really bad move. Our opponents could turn this into a starport with a bunch of shipyards. And in the next battle, those ships could destroy Yakuri from multiple different directions. We now have to fight a war on one, two, three, four fronts. That's a little bit scarier than what we had before when we were completely defended by the Spear Kata. So just keep those in mind when you're when you're making decisions in terms of war and wartime. During that war, a couple last things for you to know. I built more uh, more ships than my naval capacity can support. Remember, there's two numbers that are important. Fleet command limit tells you how many ships you can have in a single fleet. And naval capacity tells you how many ships you can have across your entire empire without incurring penalties. This entire time, I've been incurring a gigantic penalty, a 55% increased cost to the cost of all of my ships because my uh, naval size is above my naval capacity. Naval capacity is increased just like fleet command power by increasing your technologies and researching new technologies. 
So keep that in mind. My energy credits could have been much, much higher, but they're but they are incurring a large cost because I am exceeding my naval capacity. Now we just won that war, which is great. A couple things happened that you may have noticed. The first is that we now have open borders with our neighbors. And this allows our science vessels to now move through their space and find out. Like we, we've never been able to see this stuff before. What's what's out there? What's going on? You know, what are these star systems? What are they called? What's in them? Our, our uh, science vessels can now explore those and check those out. And they'll be able to um, find out more about the Spirit Gata and their kingdom. I could go this way through the Spirit Gata, which would be a really good uh, benefit for us militaristically, because in our next battle, I want to know what their space looks like. Or I have a sense that there might be some kind of sentient species out in this part of the galaxy. We haven't been able to see them because the mining drones have kept us apart, but maybe we'll be able to find an empire that kind of feels like ours, feels like home. Maybe an empire that has the same ideals of egalitarianism and xen xenophilism, that we want to live in harmony with them and, and incorporate them into our own, our own empire, our own kingdoms growing side by side in friendship, or maybe form a military alliance with them. Maybe they hate the Spirit Kata just as much as we do, and they could be a militaristic ally to us. After a war, there will be 10 years of peace, and you cannot declare war during that time. What you can do, that you normally can't though, is you will have open borders through any of their systems. So whether you win or lose, whether you use the war as a way of taking territory from your opponents or use the war as a way of getting through your opponents and out into space, war can be the way that you break free from the clutches of a bit more of a domineering species. And you can use this to your advantage to expand your empire elsewhere. This has been the final part of our Stellaris tutorial. Thank you so much for watching the whole thing. I hope it has helped you. Don't forget, I haven't covered everything, but if there are any other questions that you have, I wanna hear them in the comments. If I get enough comments with questions related to Stellaris, I will do an FAQ episode after this answering those questions. Otherwise, you can always check us out on Twitch. We stream Solaris pretty often, and you can come and ask questions about Solaris while we're playing the game. This channel probably is going to pivot to a different form of content. It's not that I don't like Solaris. I actually love the game a lot. But I think that we're probably going to start looking at a bunch of different games out there. I want to introduce you to the world of, of indie games and show you gameplay content that exists out there that you might be interested in. If that interests you, hey, you should subscribe to the channel. I would love to see you on, on future videos uh, moving forward. Your support in this series has made it possible for me to create it. So I just want to say thank you so, so, so much. Keep an eye on the official Solaris Paradox channel for more videos that may or may not be created or produced by me. I actually created a beginner's 10 first steps to playing Stellaris that went out on the official Stellaris channel, which was a blast to create. And until then, I will see you on our next video, whether that's a Stellaris video or maybe a stream or maybe somewhere else on YouTube. I'll see you then.